Morning, Rabbi. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody. Just about, just about ready to begin. And so we're starting a new a series on the Haftorah, the weekly reading from the book of the prophets. Um, so typically, the reading of the book of the prophets, typically you have some connection with the reading of the portion. So reading of the portion goes back a very long time. The Talmud says that a Moshe, Moses was the one who instituted that the people read a section of the Torah every week. And then there were two customs of how you would read it. You'd either read, finish the Torah once in three years, and then it became common to finish the Torah every year. And then they would read a portion from the, um, of the, from the Torah I'm sorry, a portion from the prophets that's related, somewhat related to the themes within the Torah portion. And that's the way it is for most of the year. Uh, the exception is the last 11 weeks of the year. Sorry, the last 10 weeks of the year. And then we read about, not so much about a connection to the Parsha, but we read about the time of the year that we're in. So right now we have that tomorrow is, tonight is the ninth above. The destruction, the day that we commemorate the destruction of the first and second temple, which is the saddest day of the Jewish calendar. So as a lead up to that, to, to the ninth of of, there are three haftorahs, three weeks where we read haftorahs of rebuke. And after the ninth of of, in other words, beginning this Shabbos, beginning this um, this um, Shabbat, we read, we read seven weeks of Haftorahs of comfort, of Nechama of comfort. So now there's a, sort of a series, and as we will explain, the, it's not just random portions of the prophets, but somehow or another, these seven weeks, there's a theme. One leads to the next. So you can read it, even though it's taken from different parts of the book, but in some sense, it's continuous, and there's a developing story here within the verses of the, of the prophets. So that's something to look out for. It's also a little bit funny that we're starting to read about the comfort right before Tisha B'Av. We're not there yet. Um, we first have to mourn, then we can be comforted. But I guess, as the Talmud says, Hashem gives the, creates the cure before the illness. So before we c commemorate the deep pain, of the destruction tonight, we know at least that if we stick around long enough on Shabbos, we'll be studying the verses of Nechama, of comfort. So that's, uh, I guess we get a taste of the comfort even before the pain of the destruction. So that's by way, by way, by way of introduction. And the Haftorah is from the book of Isaiah, Yeshayahu, and Yeshayahu, it's chapter, I believe it's mm -hmm. chapter 40. And it's interesting, Yeshayahu's name, the name Yeshayahu comes from the word Yeshua, salvation. Now there are other prophets that discussed, that discussed, that talked about and foresaw and warned about the destruction of the temple, like Jeremiah. So the name Jeremiah means Yirmiya, which the root is Mar. Mar is bitter because a lot of the prophecies are bitter. Now, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, even though Isaiah, there are also many prophecies that prophesize about the destruction that was, was to follow, but Yeshayahu also um, discusses many verses, many prophecies and verses of comfort. And maybe that's why his name is Yeshayahu, from the word Yeshua, from the word salvation. Especially most of the prophecies of comfort are in the second half of the book, beginning, I'm sorry, the last section of the book, beginning in chapter 40. So that's just interesting to point out. So what we're going to do is we'll read a few of the verses, and then we'll see what are the themes that he addresses, and how this, how this fits into the big concept, the concept of the relationship between God and the Jewish people, and how it, how it fits into the concept of the developing story of the comfort. So that's something we want to look out for. So the first thing we want to, th we want to think about is that th this Haftorah does develop. In the beginning, 
there's the tragedy of, 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 of course, the tragedy of the destruction. And then there's comfort. But what does comfort mean? What does it mean that um, we're, God is sending the prophets to comfort us for the destruction? What does comfort mean? So comfort could mean he feels our pain. Comfort could mean a promise that there won't be any more pain. Comfort can also mean redemption, which is restoration, which is God will bring us back to our former glory, right? So there are different states of comfort. What do you mean by comfort? And if you track this Haftorah, you see that it does develop, even in this, in this section of the prophets themselves. So in the beginning, in the first few verses, the comfort is what? It doesn't say anything about the future. It doesn't say anything about coming back to Zion or Jerusalem. It doesn't say anything about restoring our relationship with God. It says, don't worry, comfort, comfort my people. Why? Because we were punished enough. In other words, there'll be no more. We finished. We already got, we already got our punishment. Your punishment has been concluded. Okay, that's a, that's a comfort. It's good to know that there'll be a time that the suffering ends. But that's not as powerful as what's going to come in the future. In other words, even in this Haftorah, as it develops, where the prophet then says that um, Zion will be rebuilt, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first thing to think about is what is the nature of the comfort? When we read the verses, keep that in mind. Next thing to think about is how does God, how does the prophet refer to the people? So in the Bible, there are different metaphors. If you look at that, we discussed this when we, just, when, we sent, when we talked about the Song of Songs. In the five books of Moses, the common metaphor is parent and child, right? God says, B'ni b'chari Israel, Israel is my firstborn child. B'ni matem Hashem elokeichem, you are children of the Lord your God. That's the metaphor. There's, that there's a certain closeness, um, parents and children, essential bond. That is a very powerful metaphor. Um, when you go to the prophets further, you go into the later prophets, you see that a lot of the metaphors of the re that describe the relationship between God and the Jewish people shift from parents to children, which is the metaphor primarily used in the five books of Moses. And in the works of the prophets, you start thinking about a metaphor of relationship between a man and woman, husband and wife, which is a more of a, of a, a complex relationship, but it's also more... Um, more, more reciprocal. In other words, parents and children, typically the parents take, give the children what they need. The parents lay down the law. In a relationship between man and woman, it's more of a two-way street and, and it's more complicated. And therefore the love is, could be more intense, but the betrayal could be more painful. So a lot of the metaphors, even the metaphors of the redemption, of the destruction, refer to the, the relationship between God and the Jewish people as man and woman, husband and wife. That's also a very deep, intimate closeness. In this half Torah, that closeness does not exist yet. And therefore, the metaphor that's going to be used, at least in the beginning, you'll see later there's another metaphor. But in the beginning, the metaphor is Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, comfort, comfort my people. Not my sons, not my children, not my spouse, not my beloved, it's my people. So people is like this, a people is like a nation, like a king and his subjects. So of course, there's a relationship between his kings and his subjects, but it's not as intimate, it's not as close as parents or children or spouses. Now, because we're rebuilding the relationship. Remember, there was betrayal and there was pain and, was, and there was destruction. And now we want to restore the relationship. You can't jump ahead too fast. You have to build the comfort. So we're not going to start with the, with the comfort of bride and groom. That happens way in the end of the seven weeks, right? And some of the most beautiful, some of the beautiful, most beautiful verses of comfort discuss bride and groom. Some of them we borrow and we use in our liturgy every Friday night in the Chadodi. So there are beautiful verses to come in the works of Isaiah, but not yet, because we're building slowly. So that's the second introduction. We want to think about what is the nature of the, of the comfort. Initially, it's just, don't worry, no more pain. Nothing about rebuilding. The rebuilding is going to follow. And the second point is, you want to talk about, um, you want to talk about what metaphor is used. And the metaphor is my nation, which is a relationship, but it's not as close and it's not as intimate and not as deep as even parents and children and, relation, and, and, and the uh, 
or, or husband and wife or man and woman. And those will appear later, later, later on. So with this, with these two introductions, we'll read the first few verses. And then we'll see how the Haftarah develops. So I'm reading Isaiah chapter, chapter 40, verse 1. Console, console my people, says your God. Na'achamu, na'achamu, ami, console, console my people. Um, double language in Hebrew, I guess, is emphasis. Um, the, there are a lot of commentaries in the Medrash that talk about why do you have a double language. And some say because the pain was double, in other words, the pain of destruction was so intense, therefore, if the, if the maka, if the, if the pain was, was, was a double expression of pain, therefore, the comfort also must be doubled. But we're going to discuss the double language later on, God willing, if we have time. Okay, let's go to verse 2. Speak, oh, before that. Nachamu, nachamu, ami. Who is talking to whom? Console, console my people. Who's talking? So the commentaries explain it's not, God himself, it's not God himself talking to the people. It's God telling the prophets, go comfort my people. And later on, as the other Haftarahs develop, you will see that when the Jewish people respond, the prophets go back to God and say, We're, we don't want comfort from prophets. And eventually, God himself is the one who offers the com words of comfort. It's so, the consolation. But so far, it's God dispatching the, the prophets, right? God says, Nachamu nachmi, console, console my people. But it's not God doing it himself. God is sending the prophets to do so on his behalf. Um, how do I know? Because that, you see that in verse 2. In verse 2, it's more clear. Verse 2, God is telling the prophets. Verse 2, speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call to her, right? So it's not God's Jerusalem is a metaphor for the Jewish people. So it's, I'm sorry. So it's, it's Jerusalem is a metaphor for the Jewish people. So it's not God speaking to Jerusalem in first hand, in first person. It's God telling somebody else to speak to the heart of Jerusalem, right? Dabru alevi Yerushalayim, speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call to her, for she has become full from her host, for her iniquity has been appeased, for she has taken from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins. Malatzva'ah, she has become full. In other words, the period of, of pain has, has, has concluded. But this is what I mentioned earlier. What's the comfort? The comfort is you had enough, you, 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 you had been, you ta you, you've taken enough punishment for your sins. So there'll be no more punishment. Okay, that's nice to know. But obviously that's not the greatest form of comfort. The greatest form of comfort would, would be that sign of love, restoration of the relationship, coming back to Jerusalem, um, falling in love with God once more. All that is to follow, but it's not there yet. Where we are right now, it's just, don't worry, God dispatching the prophet saying, speak to the Jewish people and say, there is no more, no more, um, there's going to be no more punishment. That's the first two verses. Okay, now we start preparing, the verses start preparing for the return to Jerusalem. So you say, okay, beautiful. So now we have restoration, we're coming back to Jerusalem. But what is interesting about this Haftorah, and again, because it's only the beginning of the process of redemption, so if you see that the, the justification for this Haftorah, for the redemption, the way it appears in this Haftorah, this is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Okay, so the justification for the redemption in this week's Haftorah is not because of the people. It's not because God loves the people. It's be almost on behalf of God, to show the glory of God, to show the power of God. That is why God is bringing us back to Jerusalem according to this Haftorah. That's the dimension we're discussing, right? Because a lot of the, a lot of, when we look at, we look at the, we look at the, um, we look at the exile and redemption and the comfort. So a lot of times the prophets say, that God is not say, bringing us back or helping us because we merit it. It's not because we deserve it. It's because for God's own name, because people associate us with God. And if we're, we're in exile and we're being oppressed, people feel that that means our God is powerless. So God says, I'm going to bring you back 
and restore you to your glory for my own behalf, for God's behalf. So the prophet doesn't use those words, but if you look carefully, you will see that there's no real discussion here about um, the Jewish people repenting or about the Jewish people meriting or about the Jewish people as objects of God's love. A lot of this is, is about come back to Jerusalem because, and there everybody will see the glory of God. A lot of this is about God. Again, because it's just the beginning of the process of comfort and we are not necessarily deserving their redemption just yet. So that's going to be verse three, four, and five. A voice calls in the desert, clear the way of the, of the Lord, straighten out, in, straighten out in the wilderness a highway for our God. In other words, we have to come back. We have to come back to Jerusalem through the desert. So there has to be a highway. There has to be a highway prepared to come back to God. And what does the highway mean? Verse four, every valley shall be raised. Every mountain and hill shall be lowered. And the crooked ter terrain shall become a plain. And the close mountains, a champagne. In other words, what was happening here is we have to make it possible for the people to come back easy walk back to Jerusalem. And here's the culmination, verse five, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh together shall see that the mouth of, of the Lord spoke. So again, why, why was God bringing us back to Israel? Why is God bringing us back to Israel? Because um, we want everybody to see that the word of God is true. We want everybody to see that um, God's power and God's words stands. So that's a wonderful comfort, but that's compare that to what's going to come in the future. It's not as great as what will happen in the future, which is um, bringing us back, not only on behalf of God, for the honor and sake of God, but also for the, the on behalf, because of the, the merit of the people. Okay. Rabbi? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, one question. So is this, this is when Mashiach comes, or is this when the Jews are in uh, Babylonia and the destruction had just happened. So just to place, so I'll take that in a second. I just want to mention someone was asking the Haftorah that you're looking at Isaiah one is the Haftorah we read this past week. Tina, this Haftorah is the week, Haftorah we're going to read this week. That's Isaiah 40. So that's just, that's just that clarifying point. Okay. Isaiah lived during the end of the first period, about, you know, in the end of the first, during the second half of the first temple. So Isaiah is talking about, in the beginning of the book, he talks about the imminent, the, the imminent, the destruction that's to follow in a few decades. Then Isaiah talks about comfort. What is he referring to? Is he referring to the comfort that's going to happen after the rebuilding of Jerusalem that's going to happen after the 70 years in Babylonia? Or is he, is he talking about the comfort that's going to happen at the end of days? Well, the good thing about Isaiah is he's poetic. So he doesn't say exactly what he's talking about. So you can use it any way you want. And therefore, there are different opinions. Some people say, indeed, he's talking about the return in the days of Babylonia. And some people say after the, after, after the, uh, after the, the exile in Babylonia, while others say, no, it's talking about the future redemption. Now, he's vague, he's poetic, there's no date, there's no time, and that's the beauty. Some people say that's the double language. Nachamu, nachamu, comfort, comfort, console, console. Double language, some people say, well, that's for the first time. First is for the, one is for the first stage in the, in the comfort, which was, going, which was at the end of the Babylonian exile. And the second one is yet to come, right? So that's the beauty of the, of, of, um, uh, of the words of Isaiah in the sense that they can't be pinned down and therefore people can use it um, for different, in different contexts. And this becomes the sort of the general idea of redemption and what redemption will look like because, um, like I said, there is no specific exact um, explanation of what exactly he means. Okay, the problem is like this. The problem is that 
in verse three, we say a voice calls to the desert. The voice calls and says, clear away for the Lord, clear away for the Lord, meaning clear away, make a path through the desert that the Jewish people can come back and return and return to Jerusalem. The problem is that the Jewish people themselves or the speaker or someone talking on behalf of the Jews is not sure that the Jewish people actually have what it takes to rebuild. So he refers to us, who's going to come back? We're chatzir. Chatzir here, they translate it as grass, but chatzir is almost like animal fodder, which does not, it's not the most, the most, the most uh, important grain in the field, and it doesn't really last long. So that's what um, verse 6 seems to be saying. A voice says, call, and it says, what shall I call? All flesh is grass, and all its kindness is like the blossom of the field. Blossom of the field, in this context, is not saying so much that it's, po that it's beautiful, but it's saying it's just like the vegetables that grow, the, the, the grass that grows, but it's going to dry out and wither away. That's what verse 7 says. The grass shall dry out, the blossom, the, the, the blossom shall, shall wilt. For a wind from the Lord has blown upon it. Behold, the people is grass. So it seems like what the, what the prophet is saying, in other words, you're saying there's this great voice coming and saying that we have to make a way in the desert to allow for the people to return, and we're going to flatten the mountains and raise the valleys so the people can walk back, is what you're talking about. Who are the people? Who are the Jews? They're, with, they're wiltered of grass. They're grass that's, that, that's all dried up. We don't have what it takes to come and rebuild. So what is, what's the response to that? Verse 8, the grass shall dry out, the blossom shall wilt, but the word of God shall last forever. In other words, God is everlasting. God gives us the power to return. And again, this is part of the theme of the Haftorah, that the reason and the justification for the redemption is not necessarily that the people are deserving, but it's because, it's because God has, is, is uh, everlasting and God's promise is everlasting. And therefore the redemption comes as a, as a result of God's word uh, being fulfilled because God's word will be fulfilled forever. And now in uh, verse 9, 10, and 11, the verse 9 is a beautiful, beautiful verse. 10 and 11, we get another, another metaphor of God. In 10 and 11, God becomes not so a very powerful shepherd. And again, from here till the end, from verse 12 to the end, you hear about God's transcendence, God's <clears throat> greatness, the fact that God is incomparable to anybody else. And that's, the, that's to the end of the Haftorah. Why are we talking about God so much? So what we're saying, again, this is not, we're not talking about the restoration of the relationship that's more equal, like the relationship of spouses, that's going to happen later. Right now, it's God redeeming us because of his promise for his own sake to restore his own reputation. And the fact that God, you're going to say, how could God do it? There's so many challenges. Well, God is so much more transcendent and greater than anything else we know. And God's might in verses 10 and 11 represent um, the, the shepherd taking care of his sheep, right? The shepherd taking care of his sheep is a clear relationship where the shepherd, is the shepherd is the mighty, using his might to protect the sheep. But it's not like that there's a deep relationship. In other words, a reciprocal relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. So that's nine. Nine is a beautiful verse. Upon a lofty mountain ascend, O herald of Zion, raise your voice with strength, O herald of Jerusalem. Raise your voice, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. In other words, go up and herald, announce to Zion that um, we're coming back, and not to Zion, but also to the other cities of Jerusalem. If you drive from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem on the highway number one, about 15 minutes before Jerusalem, you get to see the signs for the town called Mevaseret Zion, Mevaseret Zion, the herald of Jerusalem. So that's taken from this verse. Before you go into Jerusalem, you pass by the herald of Jerusalem. So that's always beautiful. Next, verse 11 and 12. Um, verse 10 and 11 is the shepherd metaphor. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense is before him. Like a shepherd who tends his flock, with his arm he gathers lambs, and in his bosom he carries them. The nursing one he leads. Again, the metaphor of God is like the shepherd. In verse 10, talks about his strength. God is, has the strength of a shepherd taking care of the sheep, the nursing sheep, and that is the metaphor of redemption. In some sense, we finished about the redemption. 
from here to the end of the Haftarah, the theme shifts a little bit. Of course, it's related, but it shifts a little bit. And that is, that is the end of the first half of the Haftarah. So in short, to summarize, the relationship has between God and the Jewish people has uh, had a very, obviously the relationship was, was, was afraid. There is this terrible um, betrayal. The Jewish people sin, the Jewish people survive. So ultimately the betrayal brings about the destruction. And now we have to start rebuilding the relationship. So how do you rebuild the relationship? So you do it slowly. The first thing, God doesn't go himself, right? You're not, he doesn't take us on a date himself. The first thing he says, well, we're going to send the prophet, send the middleman, see what's going on. He tells the prophet, go comfort my people. What should I tell the people? Well, do you tell them I'm in love with you? No. First you stop and you say that, um, that the, the sin and the, the punishment is enough. You finish getting punished. That's step one. And that was verse two, right? You got enough punish, punishments. And then we start verse three, four, five, is don't worry, we're going to bring you back. Why are we going to bring you back? So everyone can see the word of God. Everyone can see that the word of God is going to be fulfilled. So it's almost like because the justification is God's, might, God's promise and God's might. And then we have the question of we may not even be worthy for the redemption. We may be like wil wiltered grass. It doesn't matter. But Bar Hashem, the word of God is going to last forever. And God promised to bring us back. So God is going to fulfill his promise. And then we talk about, all of a sudden, we talk about going up to Jerusalem and announcing to Jerusalem and to the cities of, God, of, cities of Judea that God is, is coming. And God here is the metaphor of the shepherd taking care of his sheep. That is the end, the, the end of verse 11. Have but, I? Yes. I hear the hallelujah chorus in this. Um, there's something exceedingly triumphant, and the word is console and comforting. And it takes you out of your, the words themselves just take you out of yourself because it's a, it's a transcendent promise of God's power. Correct. Um, it's just, but, but the music is here um, and, the, and, the, um, and the tunes go through my head as we're reading the text. I hear you loud and clear. That's beautiful. Yes. Sorry. Get when you, yeah, beautiful. Okay, from verse... 12 until the end of the Haftorah on verse 26, we talk about the greatness of God. Why does the greatness of God appear here? So you could say, God has to show his credentials. God is saying that I'm going to bring you back because I promised and I'm going to keep my word. So therefore, God shows his credentials and it talks about how God is incomparable to anybody. God can measure the seas, etc., etc., as we'll read some of the verses. So that's, that's one thing. This is, the, this is the credentials of God, and therefore, because of these credentials, he's able to, his word lasts forever, and he could bring redemption even when it is not expected. Okay, that's one angle. Another angle is that this also ties into the theme of the parsha, right? Because even though we're reading about the period of comfort, but we're always keeping one eye on trying to connect the Haftorah to the parsha. What is the parsha? The parsha talks about Moshe reiterates the Ten Commandments. Moshe talks about the fact, the revelation at Sinai, that we saw that God is the one and only God, and ain't oh, there's no other God, so there's nothing else. And Moshe is highlighting to the Jew, and, the, and the, verses, the verses of Shema appear in this parsha, the unity of God, the fact that God is one, the, the prohibition against idol worship. So in this week's parsha, you're reading about the transcendence of God. And therefore, it's no surprise that those same themes will reappear in the Haftorah. So it almost has like a double, a double meaning. This talks about God's greatness, and therefore these are God's credentials. This is why we trust that, and, we, and, we're come, and we, we hope and we know that he'll be able to fulfill the promise, because even if we're like wiltering grass, but God's word lasts forever, who's God? Oh, we have now 15 verses uh, for God's resume to talk about his greatness. And so that's, sort of come, come um, that, that is why we trust in the redemption. But there's also the idea is that it's the theme of the Parsha, which is the transcendence of God over anything else, certainly over the idols. So we'll read a little bit of those verses and we will, I don't think we'll read everything, we'll read a little just to get a little taste here and then we'll talk about a little from the Hasidic and Kabbalistic angle and we'll see from there, okay. Who measured water with his gait and measured the heavens with his span? 
and measured by thirds the dust of the earth and weighed mountains with the scale and hills with the balance. So God, while he's walking, he measures the sea. He's measuring the, 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 the earth and he's weighing mountains and valleys. Who meted the spirit of the Lord and his advisor who informs him, meaning nobody, God doesn't have any advisors. He doesn't need any advisor, advisors. With whom did he take counsel, give him to understand and teach him the way, in the way of justice and teach him knowledge and the way of understanding, did he let him know? In other words, who gives God, first is God's might in the creation, and then is who just gives, gives God wisdom? God doesn't have to get any advice from every, anybody to figure out wisdom or to figure, about, figure out how to create justice. And verse 15, behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and like dust on a, on a balance are they counted. Behold, the islands are like fine dust that blows away. And we keep, we keep going, we keep going. Um, verse 18, and to whom do you compare God and what likeness, likeness do you arrange to him? And here's a little bit of humor. The humor is that if you're gonna make an idol in verse 19, um, the description is the craftsman who wants to make an idol but wants the idol to last forever. So he goes out and he tries to find good uh, material, good, good gold or good wood, so the God shouldn't rot, so the idol shouldn't rot. So this is obviously humor, saying that the idol worshippers are creating idols, and therefore they're looking to create uh, gods that won't rot. Obviously, that, that itself is, 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 uh, is the joke, because God is everlasting. And God is sh pointing out, the, that this, or Isaiah is pointing out, pointing out, that God is, of course, in comparison to all the nations, and to the idols as well. So if you want the comedy, that's verse 19. The graven image the craftsman has melted, and the smith plates it with gold and chains of silver he attaches. He who is accustomed to select chooses a tree that does not rot. He seeks for himself a skilled craftsman to prepare a graven image which will not move, right? Or not, or not falter. So the idea is that the craftsman trying to make God is trying to find a tree and he's looking at the tree, because you, you could picture in your mind, I'm making an idol, I'm looking at the tree, I'm in the Home Depot looking at a piece of wood, making sure the wood is not gonna rot, because if the wood rots, my God is gonna rot, right? So that's a little, that's, that's the picture he's trying to paint here. And uh, we'll skip 21, look at 22. He who sits above the circle of the earth and whose inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heaven like a curtain, and he spread them out like a tent to dwell, Again, comparing the humanity to grasshoppers compared to God, who brings princes to naught, judges of, of the land, he made like a thing of naught. And a, the culmination is verse 25. Now to whom will you compare me that I should be equal, says the Holy One. Nothing in this world, nobody in this world is comparable to God. And then verse 26 is beautiful. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. These as in the hosts of heaven, the stars, the planets, who takes out their host by number, all of him he calls by name, because of his great might and because he is strong in power, no one is missing. Uh, there's an there's a interesting Hasidic commentary that we mentioned earlier, not earlier today, but earlier in the, in the past classes, verse 26, the first three words, lift up your eyes to the heaven, the acronym, the first letter of, of the word se'u and, me, and, and maro menechem is the three letters that make the word shema. Shema is shin mem ayin. Se'u maro menechem is shin mem ayin. So when we say the shema, what, what are we really doing? We are lifting our eyes heavenward and thinking about God, the creator of everything. And again, the shema is in this week's portion and the haftorah has the verse that alludes to the shema. Lift up your eyes to the heaven and see me, Bara'ela, who created these. And that's what we do when we say the Shema. So there's a little bit more to talk about this last verse, but we'll stop here because we have another few minutes left and I want to cover the other themes. So just in short, again, the first half of the Haftorah talks about comforting the Jewish people, telling them that, they're, that they have been punished enough, then telling them that we are preparing for the redemption, but the redemption is going to come because even if the Jewish people may or may not be deserving, but it's going to come here to show the power of God, the word of God will last forever, and confirming God's might. And, and then the second half of the Haftorah talks about God as 
incomparable to anything else. He's the creator. He, you know, he weighs the earth, etc. cetera, and those, those poetic descriptions. And nobody can be compared to God. We're supposed to look up. Look up to, look up to the heavens. Look up to the, to, the, to the vast expanses of the universe and see from there and deduce from there and extrapolate from there the greatness of God. So that's the simple, that's the, that's the uh, overview of the Haftar. Now we're going to do a little, a, a, little, um, a little bit of, I guess, the Hasidic perspective. And it, again, it focuses on the concept of the double comfort, right? We said in the beginning that the opening phrase of the Haftorah is Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, comfort, comfort my people. And the question is, why the double expression of comfort? Um, why, why is it said twice? So the Rebbe has a beautiful teaching based on a story in the Talmud that we may have discussed in the past, but there's a beautiful story in the Talmud. It's really two stories at the conclusion of one of the tractates, tractate Makot. And the story is as follows. The story is that there is a group of a few rabbis, I think five rabbis, amongst them was Rabbi Akiva, and they had to go travel to Rome. There was some decree, they had to travel to Rome. So they're going to Rome, and they're at a great distance from Rome, and they already hear the noise coming and emerging from this great city. And the contrast between Ju Judea, which was desolate, and Jerusalem, which was desolate, and this city that is full of life and full of excitement, the contrast was so powerful that the other rabbis start crying. And Rabbi Akiva sees this, looks at the same theme, and he's the same scene, and he's laughing. They say, why are you laughing? He says, why are you crying? So they say, look, our home, the, uh, the, the, the home of God is burnt by the fire. And by who? By the Romans. And these people are sitting in comfort and in tranquility. How could we not cry? So Rabbi Akiva says, look, he says, look, if this is what God does to go to those who go against his will, that those who go against his will, the Romans had so much peace and tranquility. Could you imagine how much more so we're going to get in the future, those who follow God's will? It's the end of the first story. Then you have the second story. Second story is that they're coming back. I don't know if they're coming back. Second story is they're going, they're climbing, they're going to Jerusalem and they come to Mount Scopus, Har Hatsophim, the mountain from where you could see the temple. So the law is if you, could, if, you, if you see the destruction of a temple, you have to tear your garments. So they tear their garments. Then they come closer and then they see a fox that emerges from the place where the Holy of Holies was. So they cry. He laughs. They ask him, why are you laughing? He says, why are you crying? So he said, they say, look, the verse says that no foreigner, anyone who's not a high priest, no foreigner should be al is allowed to go on the place of the Holy of Holies. And if a foreigner goes there, he'll be put to death. And now it's been plowed. And Shualim Hil Chubo, there are foxes roaming. And they tell Rabbi Akiva, why are you laughing? And Rabbi Akiva gives this whole story that there are two prophets. One prophet, one prophet prophesied about the destruction and the other prophet prophesied about the redemption. And God combines the two. Long story short, he basically says, as long as I didn't see the, the prophecies of destruction coming about, being fulfilled, I wasn't sure that the prophecies of the redemption will be fulfilled. But now that I see the prophecies of destruction have been fulfilled, now I know the prophecies of redemption will also be fulfilled. When they heard him say that, they said as follows. This is, this is the quote. The Talmud gives us, gives us the quote. This is Belashon Hazeh. This is the expression they used. They said, Akiva nechamtanu, Akiva nechamtanu. Akiva, you comforted us. Akiva, you comforted us. Again, they employ the double language. So there's a whole Hasidic discussion about why, does, why do they use the double language? That's one question. The other question is, how come they did not tell Akiva you comforted us after the first story? They only say it after the second story, right? The first story, they saw Rome in its glory. They cry, he laughs. Everybody justified what, what they did. They didn't tell Akiva, Akiva, you comforted us. Here, they say, Akiva, you comforted us. And they say not just one, but, tw but once, but twice. So there's a lot of deep um, Kabbalistic interpretations to this story. I'm going to stay, I'm just going to give you a little nugget. The nugget is as follows. The verse Rabbi Akiva evokes when he talks about the destruction, 
He says, the verse says, Zion will be plowed like a field. Sion Sadeh Techaresh. Zion will be plowed like a field. And this is alludes a little bit to what we discussed this past Friday. You can look at the at the at the at the suffering as destruction. Or you can look at it as plowing a field. What is plowing a field? You're destroying the earth. Yes, but why are you plowing the field? Because plowing the field is a step in the process of growth. And what Rabbi Akiva explains to them in the second story is that the pain of destruction is actually part, is like plowing a field. On the surface, it looks like you're just uprooting the earth. You're not doing anything constructive. But the truth of the matter is, the truth of the reality is that the pain of the difficulty of the exile actually allows for the redemption to grow. It allows for that which we, we will achieve that happens through the process of growth that takes time. But here is the key. The key, key is the destruction is part of the process of rebuilding. That's why they say double language. Why double language? You comforted us about the redemption, but then you also comforted us that the destruction is critical for the redemption because the destruction itself now, you look back and you see the destruction as something positive in the sense that it's part of the process of growth. That is the double language of you comforted us, you comforted us, you showed us that the pain that we experienced is actually critical for the growth and therefore it is part of the process of growth. And that's a big idea. We could talk about it. Just to highlight that idea, one more angle in the in the in the in the in the Haftorah, verse three, a voice calls in the desert, clear the way of the Lord, straighten out in the wilderness, a highway for our God. Now you're coming back from Jerusalem. You're coming back to Jerusalem. We're coming from all different places. We're not necessarily crossing the desert, but verse three evokes the desert. So the Hasidic interpretation is as follows. What is a desert? A desert in the, in the books of the prophets is parched land. The Eretz Tziavayef, dry parched land, there's no water. And the desert is a met metaphor of thirst. And the idea is as follows. Why is, how, wh how, the voice of redemption calls from the desert. In other words, the difficulty, the distance from God that we experience in, in, in during the exile, that's considered the desert. Now, the side effect of being in the desert, of being distant, is that when there's no water, people long for water even more than when they were in the city. So again, the theme that the redemption comes about because of the voice in the desert, the distance itself, the longing itself, brings about the, the, the thirsting and the longing for God that then becomes the fuel for the redemption. So that is a, a, few of the, a few of the points. There's more to discuss, but I think that would be it for today. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to continue next Wednesday on the second, uh, the second half hour of comfort. And ultimately, we'll do all seven, and hopefully in good health, maybe we'll do a cycle, maybe we'll do a full year of the half Torahs. So looking forward to continuing our discussions. Have a wonderful day. If anyone has any questions, please share. Otherwise, have a wonderful day and an easy and meaningful fast. And we should merit to receive God's comfort speedily in our days. Amen. Amen.